Hello, my name is Bernabe Linares Barranco and the title of my talk is Event-Driven Convolution-Based Processing. The outline is as follows. Uh, I'm gonna start talking about the efficiency of information encoding in, in the brain. Then I will go quickly through an old project that uh, ha happened some time ago, the Caviar project where the DBS was invented and also an improvement of the DBS that we developed in our lab, the sensitive DBS. Then I will go with event-driven convolutions on ASICs, FPGAs and on the Spinnaker platform that we have performed in, in our lab. And we'll talk uh, afterwards about event driven convolutions for stereo visions and uh, finish with two examples of uh, learning applications using a special temporal backpropagation on Spinnaker and also using stochastic binary STDP. So uh, as an introduction, uh, uh, when, when you consider conventional uh, artificial vision systems, they are typically based on, on using conventional cameras that take images one after the other, and then each image is, is processed by some computing platform to extract features, combine features, and do object uh, detection, classification, and recognition, and decision. All this is, is very computing hungry, and uh, what 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 we know is is that uh, biological biological brains they work in a completely different way. Uh, we don't have uh, in our retina we don't take pictures and our brain does not uh, process one picture after the other. No, it's, it's, everything is is more continuous. For example, this one here, this layer represents the retina, and then we have a, a, a sequence of layers in the brain that just communicate uh, spikes uh, asynchronously somehow. They project the spikes from one layer to the next one, and they do the processing. One interesting uh, publication uh, from Simon Thorpe in, in Nature 1996 is an experiment uh, that he describes that, that he did uh, for a long time. Um, where he, he actually, when you go and visit him, he will uh, play the experiment on you. you he sits you on, on front of a computer and then he flashes pictures. Uh, and he asks you to push the, the mouse whenever you see, for example, a face or, or a person in, in a picture and the pictures are random. And then he measures uh, the delay. And what is interesting is that, that he knows, no, because he, he knows about neuroscience and he knows the delays between flashing some picture and all, all the layers in the brain that, that have to process until some motor action command is, is produced. And he knows that the delay between one layer to the next one is in the order of uh, 10 to 20 milliseconds. And he also knows the speed of communicating spikes from one layer to the next one. So his conclusion was that uh, for this very fast uh, flashing picture recognition experiment, the neurons that were involved in, in this recognition task only had time to just fire one neuron. And this reveals a very energy efficient and information encoding uh, efficiency of our brain, which we try to mimic when we build uh, artificial systems. So we try to mimic the communication and processing based on spikes. And in electronics, we take advantage of the high speed of, of electronics and micro, microelectronics, which is much faster than, than biology, uh, biology technology. And, and what, what is used is, is called address event representation. In address event representation, whenever you have a spike, for example, in one chip, you, what you send out is, is uh, some ID or the coordinate of, of that uh, neuron that, that produced the spike. And then these buses that communicate uh, digital information between chips, they are very, very fast. No? They, they have latencies within nanoseconds. No? So we can multiplex the, the, the biological connectivity from, from one area of the brain to another area of the brain, we can multiplex it in time, taking advantage of the high speed uh, of electronics. And this way we can mimic uh, largely connected networks no, that are massively connected. And so uh, address event representation was actually proposed in 1991 in, in, in Caltech by the lab of Carver Mead. It is widely used today, in, for example, in the Human Brain Project, in Spinnaker, Loihi, and most of the uh, SNN chips that are published today. There is no need for timestamps, except when you want to record uh, and process, uh, except when, when you record to process offline. And everything is data and event driven, and time represents itself, similar to, to biology. 
So next, let's go to the Kavya project. The Kavya project is a project that happened between 2002 and 2006 in, in frame program five. So it's, it's pretty old, but in that project, the, the, the DBS was invented by, by Toby Delbrook and, 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 and his lab. And also the first implementation of the uh, event-driven convolution ships also happened in, in this lab. So here I'm, I'm showing the, the final demonstrator that we built in, in that project. We have here the, the DBS retina from Toby. Here we have convolution chips. We have a Winnetic gold chip also developed by Ini Labs and, and some learning chips that would do something similar to STDP. But at that time, uh, we didn't hear about STDP yet. And also we had some interfacing um, uh, boards that were developed in this project for remapping and visualizing on computer whatever was was being observed. So here, for example, in, in this picture, you can see, oops, let me go back. Here in this picture, you can see here the DBS, which is observing uh, a cartoon that is rotating with circles uh, of different sizes. We can see it here. This is what the retina is showing, a small circuit and a big circle rotating very quickly. The output of the, of the convolution layer, which is here, is picking up the center of the big circle. The winner take all is cleaning it up. And then we do some uh, centering of the big circle on, on the screen. And all this is done with very little latency in the order of milliseconds or fraction of milliseconds. And this, this was like the first demonstration of, of a very nice uh, big system using uh, address event representation with many modules and, and solving all the practical problems that, that we were facing. A few years later, we, we developed uh, our own uh, DBS sensor, which we called, actually Toby called it uh, the sensitive DBS, no? because we, we managed to improve contrast sensitivity by a factor of 10 uh, with a smaller circuit and, and uh, also low power and low mismatch. Let me just go quickly. I was told to not go into the circuit details. So these are all the circuits that I will show in this presentation. Here, here I'm showing the time evolution of, of a light signal of, of a photo of a photo sensor or in, in one of the pixels. A very uh, every time there is a, an increase in, in log of the photo current and increase in, in theta, a new spike is, is transmitted or generated. For example, here you can see positive spikes when the light was increasing and crossing these theta steps. And when it goes down, it generates negative theta steps. And with this circuit, uh, there is a gain that is proportional to, to this ratio of these two capacitors. And in Toby's uh, retina, it was 20. This means that he needed a ratio of, of 20 between two capacitors, which took most of the area. You can see here, this is the original pixel by Toby. Uh, the red part are the capacitors. So he had the huge capacitors and the tiny one here, which were C1 over C2, because he needed a ratio of 20 between the areas. Now, what we did a few years later is instead of using this uh, circuit here that would give you a, a log voltage proportional to the log of the photocurrent, which is multiplied which is multiplying the log of the photocurrent by n times ut. We use this circuit here that used a very interesting trick based on trans impedance amplifier, just using n diode connected MOS transistors. And it turns out that instead of this gain, you have this one here. You multiply, you multiply the gain by this, by the number of, of uh, MOS transistors that you have here. So this means there is no mismatch. You have a gain without mismatch you you improve this gain when and we cascaded two of these stages so we got an extra gain of n square so if you have for example four of these transistors you would multiply the original gain by by 16 which allowed us to use a smaller uh, capacitance ratio of, of just about five and this helped us to obtain a slightly smaller overall pixel because we needed less capacitors because we just needed a factor five and this also allowed us to increase the gain, the overall gain from 20 to 120, so one order of magnitude. So at the end, we improved contrast sensitivity by a factor of 10, and we could go down to 1.5% uh, contrast sensitivity, although the noise was slightly larger. It was 2.1 to 2.6 uh, RMS equivalent noise, no? and, and we patented 
this uh, this this idea and it was licensed to prophecy and actually thanks to this patent uh, prophecy allowed us to become uh, co-founders of, of their company here are the two recordings of, of two retinas in in, in in a stereo setup and you can see that the contrast sensitivity is, is actually very nice no? now let's go more to to convolutions how to do convolution chips and either, or, or how to do event driven convolution on FPGAs or on the spinet. The, the basic idea is illustrated here. So, whenever a coordinate comes in, the idea is to project the kernel into a, a neighborhood. And, and this uh, is an array of integrated and fire neurons. And when you get the contribution, you just add this contribution to each of the integrated and fire neurons. The architecture that does this is, is in, in, in our chips is like this. We have an array of integrated and fire neurons. Then there is some communication circuitry that takes the event from the outside. And every time an event comes in, you have the, the kernel that is stored in this kernel RAM. It will copy very quickly row by row the kernel around this coordinate and then give a pulse to update all these integrators in, in, in one step. And, and this, would, this was actually very fast. Now we could have an input event through, uh, an input event throughput between 17 megabend per second to 1.5 megabend per second, depending on how many lines the kernel would have, which could be between one line or 32 lines. The output event throughput could be faster if it was using the standard AER output circuitry from a retina, could go up to 37 megabands per second. We could store up to 32 different kernels because the input address had some bits, up to five bits to select which kernel to pick, which was good for building convolutional neural networks. And then the kernel size could be arbitrary and also it could have an offset, an arbitrary offset that we could program. So if this was the input address, we could place the, the kernel anywhere with an offset. And here you can see a, a recording from the Caviar project. There was a, a person juggling with, with three balls and the convolution, which was programmed to do a, a circular kernel to detect the, the surrounding of the balls, the circumference of the ball, it would follow the center of the balls, as you can see here in, in real time and, and very fast. Now, uh, these uh, event-driven chips, uh, convolution chips, they were very interesting because we could do uh, arbitrary arbitrary uh, kernels, but we could also do like Mexican head type of, of kernels, which would do winner-take-all operation. And this is what we are illustrating here. We were recording a, a spiral on an old uh, phosphor oscilloscope. The spiral was five kilohertz of, of frequency. And the output events from, from the DBS were merged with the output events of the convolution chip, which would come back and they were the, the two flows, they were merged and this would constitute the input to the convolution chip. But if the, if the event was coming from the sensor, we would use one kernel, kernel K1, which is this one here, diffusive kernel. And when the events were coming from the output of the chip, we would use the other kernel K2, which was a Mexican head. So we were doing first a diffusive operation to, to reduce the number of, uh, of, of information to, to concentrate the information and, and, and blur it a little bit, and then do a winner take all operation to concentrate the information. And, and this, red, this red output here, or this red here, shows the output of, of the convolutions, you know, doing the, the, diffuse, the diffusion and the winner take all operation. So here we have a capture of 300 microseconds, the input and the output. The, the output of the DBS in green and the output of the convolution in, in red. And you can see in, the, in this uh, projection in Y time that the lag between the center of the events coming from the retina to the output of the winner take all convolution is 10 microseconds. So we could uh, do very low latency for winner take all operation using, using this chip, which is quite powerful. Another interesting thing about uh, event-driven convolutions, as you can see in this recording, in this recording, we are observing two people working and here we're doing a convolution, which is a vertical Gabor filter to extract the uh, vertical edges. One, one interesting observation that you can see is that it filters out temporal noise. So all the temporal noise is filtered out, but also you filter out spatial noise because if, if the subject is moving, 
you filter out the mismatch of, of the pixels because you are averaging over a region of the integrated fire neurons. Also, it has a forgetting rate, so you can detect feature within a time window. And the, the most interesting property that I wanted to highlight here is the pseudo simultaneity, which means the, that input and output are almost simultaneous. For example, here we can see a capture of 40 milliseconds of the retina output and the capture of the output of the convolution chip in the same 40 milliseconds. And you, we can write or graph the events in time. Uh, coordinate versus time, for example, and we can see that this corresponds to X, to the same 40 milliseconds. Of course, there will be a, a delay of a few events between you have an output of, of a vertical edge detection because you can, you need to collect four to five uh, uh, retina event to, to, to tell that there is a vertical edge, but this is a very fast uh, delay. So overall, what we can say is in, that input and output of event driven convolution is almost uh, simultaneous. And, and this means that when you when you assemble several layers, you, you will have this pseudo simultaneity from one layer to the next one and so on. And also here I wanted to highlight, for example, if we have here a feature map, which is implemented with a scheme similar to, to the convolution ship that I described before, it is it is very convenient to have several kernels, no? depending on, on where the, uh, the, the incoming event is coming from from another feature map from here here you pick a different kernel no? and and this you can this way you can we can assemble a convolution convolutional neural networks uh, very easily and this is for example what we illustrate here with with a poker card uh, recognition experiment we just shuffle a poker card deck this is in real time uh, and then the computer shows it with 20 millisecond frame time here is a very slow uh, playback, 300 times slower, and, and each frame time used by the computer here is, is 75 uh, microseconds. And then the recognition, which is made of these uh, three-layer uh, ConvNet, operates li like follows. This is real time, so this is the tracking of the symbols following following this recording. And, and these are the symbols, are the recognition. So you can see that the recognition is, is actually very fast. And here we have a, an, an XY time, sorry, XY, XY time projection of, of one of these captures. And you can see that from the onset of a new card to the recognition of the new symbol is less than two milliseconds. So this shows uh, the great potential of uh, convolutional processing. And, and here, for example, we are showing an example uh, implementation of Gabor filters on the Spinnaker platform. No? We, we implemented 15 different uh, Gabor filters of different scales and orientation. So we have 15. This is a replica of the retina, of the retina output. And, and here you can see uh, the sensitive retina that we developed in our lab, which is uh, all the events are sent to this board that communicates through SATA with the Spinnaker board. The Spinnaker board would do all this convolution and send the output back to this board here, which would then send it to, to this other board to visualization on, on JAR. On, on a computer screen. So let's now move to uh, some work that we did on uh, convolutions for stereo vision using uh, Gabor filters. So since we knew how to do Gabor filters, we wanted to exploit this for, for stereo vision. No? The idea is, is as follows. Uh, so when, when you have two retinas and you want to do uh, stereo, Stereo vision, you need to match uh, the events of, of two retinas. And, and one way of doing it is, is to match the events by applying a, a set of restrictions. One is that they have to happen in, in the same time window. They have to have the same polarity. They have to fit the epipolar line constraint. And they have to belong, in our case, to the same orientation convolution. And this is what we were doing here. We were doing all these convolutions for one retina we were doing three convolutions. So for this retina one, we were doing three convolutions, 45 minus 45 and 90 degrees. And for the other retina, we were doing the same convolution. And we were using this output to do uh, event matching. And once we match, have matched them, then do a 3D reconstruction in, in space. And, and this is an example here. You can see the setup with the two retinas and, and the FPGA, because this was done on an FPGA. And here you can see the recording. And, and in real time, the, all the convolutions. And then we took this recording offline. And here, of course, it's not the same object. It's not the cube, it's, it's, it's a pen that was moving in front of the retina. And, and uh, with the help of these uh, Gabor filters, we could do uh, 3D reconstruction and, and estimate the depth with respect to the camera plane. 
So this is an interesting thing. Uh, another interesting work that, that we did recently is uh, spatial temporal back propagation on, on spiking deep confidence and implemented implementing this on, on Spinnaker. So the, the idea is very simple. We just took a, a three layer confident and applied uh, spatial temporal back propagation, but we added for learning this extra term. This extra term is a regularization term, which would count all the spikes happening internally in the network. We, did, we didn't use the external spikes, only just the internal ones. And we wanted to minimize this. No, we added this term to the loss function in order to minimize. And, and then we played with this regularization factor, which can take a value between zero and one and obtain different results as shown in this slide. So here in the horizontal axis, we are showing different values of, of lambda, the regularization factor. And we could see the spike rate of the internal layers. Here in, in blue is one example, which is the confident example that I showed in the previous slide. But we also tested with a fully connected um, network no? to, to, to see how the spike count was actually reduced as, as we increased the, the regularization factor. And here we can see the recognition, the classification error. Interesting, interestingly, we, we see that for the confident, there is a minimum. And actually, this minimum happens at uh, lambda equals 0 0.1 which is when uh, the, the rate of the internal neurons, the spiking rate of the internal neurons, approximate the one of the brain, which is 10 hertz. So this was uh, very interesting. And here in the next slide, you can see some examples no, of input flow, uh, activity, spiking activity in the, in the inter internal layers and the output. And here for the case, the previous one was for the fully connected layer, and here is for the convolutional layers. No? some input spike activity, internal activity, the fully connected layer, and the output recognition. Now, the last point is uh, uh, stochastic binary STDP. This is um, an interesting work that we did motivated by, by a, a project on Membrister that only allowed binary weights. So we wanted to explore if we can do uh, STDP with binary weights. And, and to do that, we did the following reasoning. This is the, the standard uh, STDP rule. We change the weight depending on whether delta T, the delta T between the pre and the post synaptic spike is positive or negative. We do uh, reinforcement or, or negative reinforcement uh, of the weights. This is a standard STDP, but we use this modified STDP no? in which uh, we apply a positive weight when it is within a, a time window. And for the rest, we apply a negative, uh, a negative weight change. But instead of doing this with respect to time, we computed, is, we computed with respect to the order of the events, not the delta t, but the delta n. When you store the list of events, you just look at the order. And if uh, the, the, the order is within a window of np, we apply a positive uh, increment to the weights. Otherwise, we apply a negative weight. But for binary weights, we need to have, uh, we cannot do gradual changes. We need to do all the change in once. So we, we use probability of change. We apply a probability of change instead of a delta of the weight. And we use this in a two layer system. One for feature extraction and, and another one, which is a very simple classifier. And for the feature extraction, we do two things. We either use random weights or we use uh, stochastic binary STDP to see if it was helping the classifier. And uh, uh, beside that, we also applied some tricks like homeostasis. We use double integrators for the neurons. We also increase the threshold of the neurons after STDP up update to make them more selective. The, the threshold would actually saturate at some point. And we also, of course, use lateral inhibition no, to distinguish between the classes. And the result was very interesting. You can see here uh, for different uh, cases, we used uh, one bit weights and compared them with eight bit weights. And also red and black means uh, for pure random weights. So the blue one, which means binary weights and STDP, we got uh, accuracy, I mean, we got a recognition accuracy, a satisfactory accuracy with this, uh, with, with uh, 128 uh, binary computation, uh, binary, binary synapses, which was the same hardware complexity, the horizontal axis is hardware resources of 16 8 bit neurons. Hmm? So the horizontal axis is hardware complexity. You can see that with less hardware complexity, we were able to achieve good accuracy. And also interestingly, 
we needed this graph is for uh, average number of spikes per neuron. We needed less spikes when using one bit STP neurons. So this was also very interesting hmm, that we could reduce hardware complexity and uh, uh, number of spikes. So in conclusion, in, in this presentation, I have given you in bed driven convolution that, that, that can be very fast. I've shown that can be very fast. They filter out temporal and spatial noise. We can do winner take all and competition kernel with them. We showed examples of ASICs, FPGAs, and Spinnaker. They, they can be used for stereo matching uh, very, very easily. And they show efficient low rate uh, spatial temporal back propagation on, on Spinnaker using the NMNIST uh, data set. And we also showed the one bit stochastic STDP for low noise resources hardware with less spikes. Okay, thank you very much.